Before we start with the next subsection, let's recap what we have so far. So, as we all remember, the physical layer delivers us a sequence of bits. Whatever they mean, the physical layer does not care. So the first task, and this was our framing, mechanisms for deciding when does this frame start and also when does a frame end. We saw different methods. There's also a method simply performing the checksum and then if the checksum fits, we can define this is the end. But that was the first important task here of the link layer, framing. Because without frames, we cannot apply any of the other mechanisms. The second problem we had, so framing, check. Second was error detection and correction. So we do not know if the bits are correct. So maybe this bit was flipped. So it was a one and now a zero, vice versa, etc. We do not know which bit was flipped, how many bits, etc. So we learned that we can use our message M and we add some redundancy. Let's say this might be the redundancy. And then we can use the redundancy together with the message to check if there was an error. And maybe we can even correct it. And we learned we had the two methods. One is the forward error correction. So we can try to correct errors on the receiver side. If we cannot correct it, we have to drop the packet. And we had the alternative ARQ. That means if we detect an error, we have to request a new packet. So the sender has to resend it. So error detection and correction. We also learned if we do so, well, we have to start numbering our packets. So we introduced sequence numbers. We learned we need acknowledgements, negative acknowledgements. And we learned that we have to control the flow of the packets. Why? Because a big computer may flood a tiny little, little one. Think of Internet of Things. And the little one must be able to say stop. First I have to think. Now you can send new data. Or somehow we limit the data flow. So we learned a bit about these schemes of stop and wait and sliding window. Now with these three basic mechanisms, we know how we can actually create frames, how we can control them, check for errors. But there's a bit more to do, and I will cover this now, and this is called the medium access control. The medium, for example, a cable, the space around the computer, whatever we use for transmitting our signals, well, this medium might be used by more than one computer. And like in a lecture hall, somehow we have to control who is allowed to access the medium, who is allowed to talk in a lecture hall. Medium access control is all about this, controlling the access. If more than one node is able to access a medium at the same time, for example. Okay. We already talked about NICs, network interface cards, and we talked about very simple ones. So simple point to point. Two nodes, well, this is, well, from a protocol perspective, quite simple. If additionally we have a duplex medium, so for example, frequency division duplex, so we separate the directions in frequency, or we use space, or we use time, then it's quite simple. If we have two points, then we have the two directions separated somehow. For example, two fibers, if you use fiber optic, one for each direction. And that's very simple because then we always have one sender and one receiver and vice versa, one sender and one receiver. Okay, there's nothing we have to do for medium access. But as soon as we share the medium with more than two nodes, then we have to control the access. For example, 
if we have a bus system. That was not only the classical old Ethernet, so we'll come back to this, but also think of having a uh, wireless system. What is a bus? So basically, as soon as you send data onto the medium, all the others will receive it. So this is broadcast by nature. All the others will receive it. Okay. We could have rings for certain reasons or uh, resilience, etc. We can have stars with a very simple component in the center. We'll learn about these components. So if one station sends something, this simple component broadcasts this message to all the others. Or we could have something like a mesh network, partial, fully mesh network. That means that some nodes can directly, if they uh, send their data, maybe they send it to several of these nodes. Well, we see what this means. So maybe at the same time, for some reasons, maybe some others also send. And now if you think of wireless connection, there might be a problem here as soon as those messages overlap. Okay, we'll see where we have this network interface card for shared mediums or for this point-to-point. -point. Why is a partial mesh somewhere in the middle? Well, we can also think of having a scenario where we only have many point-to-point -point full duplex connections and the nodes know exactly when I send a message, I only send it over this one link and nothing can happen, there's no collision, etc. So, shared medium with more than two nodes, we have to organize something. A bit more about those network interface cards. As soon as we have more than two nodes, we have to manage certain special issues. Uh, one is, let's start from the bottom, we need identification. We have to know who's who. And these are those famous MAC addresses. So medium access control addresses. Maybe you've heard of it. They have a special format here. We have these six bytes and they should be unique. Also, they should be worldwide unique for network interface cards. So all the network interface cards have a unique MAC address. That's the basic idea. Okay, why do we need addresses? Well, if one station sends data on this shared medium, wireless medium, wired medium, that doesn't matter now, this frame is distributed over the medium and all those stations will receive the frame without telling, well, who is the receiver, they all receive it and try to interpret it. So this is why I have to say, okay, I want to send it to A. And one of these computers is A. Then all the others will notice, okay, there's someone who wants to send something to A. I'm not A because I'm B and C and D and whatever. Only A will finally pick the frame and tries to understand, ah, okay, someone wanted to send something to me because I'm A. So we need identification. But what else do we need? In this example, if one computer sends something, well, that's simple. But what happens in this setting if several computers try to send something? So we have our computers here, A, B, C, and so on. So now what happens if D wants to send something, a message, but also B wants to send something? And as I said, it doesn't matter if it's wired or wireless. If we have this structure, this bus structure, we may run into a problem because sooner or later, those think of electromagnetic waves, they will collide here. So we have a collision here and we produce garbage. We don't know if this is one, a zero, it's noise or whatever. So we cannot send in this simple example at the same time. So somehow we have to control 
who is allowed to use this channel, to use the wire, to use the wireless medium. There are different approaches, two fundamentally different approaches. One is we can do this in a distributed fashion. What does it mean? So all those nodes are responsible for executing a certain algorithm to do this medium access control. We learn how this works. So they're all responsible. There's no big boss here controlling all the others. That's one way of doing it. And the other way is, okay, no, all the other nodes uh, but me, they are not allowed to do anything. I am the big boss. So there could be one station acting as the big boss in the network, telling all the others, I am the one. Like a teacher in a classroom, and I can tell this computer, now you're allowed to uh, send something, for example. And the next time I tell A, now A is allowed to send, then B and C. So you can do something like a round robin. So you can have a centralized Mac with kind of a master station. And there are examples for this. Bluetooth, such an example, a classical Bluetooth. You have a centralized a master and many so-called slaves. So what can be done with this centralized approach? One example is you have a master device managing and doing this, what I just mentioned, round robin. Round robin can be done in a very fixed fashion, so fixed TDMA, time division, multiple access. You remember, if I combine a multiplexing technology like time division multiplexing with a clever algorithm, we have a multiple access method. In this case, time division multiple access. So there could be a master somewhere telling in this example, we have three nodes and the master then tells, okay, now one can use the whole spectrum, the resource, whatever, and then two, and then three, then again one, then two, then three, etc. And you can do this in a very fixed pattern, very simple. And maybe you remember when we sampled and quantized speech, we generated a data stream of fixed 64 kilobit per second. And then I said, okay, I need, for example, 8 bit every 100, uh, I think 125 microseconds. Okay, so if I organize this in a way, and we saw already examples that my turn is always every 125 microseconds, and then I squeeze in my 8 bits here, then this results in a guaranteed data stream of 64 kilobit per second. That's the idea of this very fixed pattern. This was the classical way of the classical digital telephone system. But we can also use it for other things, for fixed delays, guaranteed data rates. Uh, not really flexible, we'll come to this more flexible. So that's one way of doing it. But please be aware, TDMA not automatically means it's fixed, like here in this round robin, simple approach. TDMA only means we multiplex in time and we use a clever algorithm for it, and this is how we get a TDMA scheme. They are fixed, but they are also pretty dynamic TDMA schemes. We can also go into the frequency domain. Why not? So there could be a master that allocates different frequencies. So master allocates the frequency, and the nodes get a certain portion of the transmission capacity for the whole time. So FDMA, with a clever algorithm, we can say, okay, now um, we assign user three certain frequency, a range for frequency, part of spectrum for a certain time, and user two gets another one. The clever TDMA scheme could also switch this and say, okay, user th three now needs less and user two, so we have three, two needs more, one a bit less. So the TDMA, uh, the FDMA approach can also include that over time, we change the assignment of the spectrum 
to a node. Or we can have it completely fixed, like radio stations, like classical TV stations. We assign them a certain part of the spectrum, fixed. So if we do it fixed, like shown here on this slide, we have certain drawbacks, which is quite obvious. So what are the drawbacks as soon as you have fixed patterns? Well, uh, they're not flexible, quite obvious. The problem is that a lot of user traffic is quite bursty. What does it mean? So for example, if I read a web page, I don't transmit anything because I am reading. Then I click on a link and then suddenly I need whatever, three megabytes download. And then I'm reading again. So typical user behavior creates bursty traffic. An exception is this constant bitrate audio, for example, or video stream for constant bitrate. But also for video streams, you have variable bitrate depending on the coding. Maybe if a scene doesn't change too much, uh, the data rate goes down. And yeah, if you have many changes in the scenes from uh, frame to frame, data rate goes up. But if we assume a bursty behavior of users, and then we take one of these fixed schemes, well, <laughs> a lot of these resources will be idle most of the time. And this wastes resources, because if I do not have to download anything, the scheduler will still schedule me or give me a certain part of the spectrum. Additionally, well, this is nice for a fixed and I have to say low number of users, because for the round robin, you go through all the users, also for assigning frequencies, you go through uh, the users. But what happens if you have sometimes two users and sometimes 200 users? How do we adapt? So it's quite difficult to adapt these fixed schemes to dynamic number of users. So fixed schemes, okay, they have their application, but they are not very flexible. Okay, so we can have a master and here are examples for fixed schemes. So we have master plus fixed. Please be aware, it's not automatically the case that all the schemes with masters are fixed. We can also have a master that reacts in a very dynamic fashion. It's still we have a master, but we have a very dynamic assignment. So this is just an example for centralized and very fixed schemes. Master and dynamic, this is something Again, for mobile communications, LTE, uh, resource assignments. So we have a master, that's the base station, and but we can very dynamically assign resources. So that's a very dynamic scheme with a master. So master and fixed, master and dynamic. So what is the alternative to having a master? We can distribute the whole medium access. And again, with this distributed medium access, we will see we have distributed and very flexible, very dynamic. That's something we can have. There are also examples where you have a distributed scheme. They are rare, but there are some uh, that are quite static. Certain token passing schemes can be uh, can guarantee certain data rates are quite static, uh, but distributed. Okay, so what is the model here? So the idea is that we have an independent nodes computers. So and they can generate their frames for transmission, and we have a single channel and we transmit over this channel. And what does a collision mean if two frames are transmitted simultaneously? We have a collision. So we do not assume different frequencies for different sender receiver pairs, but we all use the single channel and only one sender can use the channel at a time. So it's quite important that we manage somehow the time. There are different ways of how we manage the time. So one way is we have a so-called continuous time. So 
we don't have any master clock. So if you want to send, you simply send. That's the simple scheme. We can also have something that's called slotted time. So we divide the time into discrete time intervals. And we have to start sending always at the beginning of a slot. What does it mean? We need someone, some node that synchronizes all the other nodes. We'll come back to this when we compare different medium access schemes. So it's still distributed. And we can have distributed with continuous time and slotted time. So we need some mechanisms that now deal with this setting. We have n nodes, we have a single channel, we transmit everything over this channel, but we cannot send at the same time or we can, but then we have collisions. Plus, maybe we want to be quite dynamic for the flexibility, for this bursty traffic. You remember bursty traffic? So we have to be flexible, dynamic, distributed system. So how can we do this? And there are different schemes. There are some classical schemes and uh, some more advanced ones. So very classical scheme is, for example, we sit together around a campfire and whoever has a token, piece of wood, whatever, is allowed to talk. So only the owner of a token is allowed to send. What does it mean? Well, if you have the token, you can send something into the medium, into the cable or into the air. Doesn't matter. There cannot be a collision because there is only one token. If you're the owner of the token, you may send. Then you send your data and then you pass on the token to your neighbor to the left, for example. Then your neighbor has the token, but that means you are no longer allowed to send. But now your neighbor maybe can send if the neighbor has to send something. Okay. And then again, you pass the token to the next one. And then this one can send. So this ensures, if you do this cycle passing of the token through all the nodes, that all the nodes sooner or later will be able to send something. And only one node can infect something. So there cannot be any collisions. So there are some nice advantages. You have guaranteed access and no collisions. Why guaranteed access? Well, if you limit the time you're allowed to hold the token, so you say, okay, max one second. So you can have the token and then you have to pass it after one second. You can have the token, you pass it after one second. Have the token, pass it after one second. Then four can calculate how long does it take? I passed my token one second past one second. So I do the math, one, two, three, four, after five seconds, it's my turn again. That means you have guaranteed access. You have no collision because only who has the token is allowed to send. Perfect. So it's fair. You have guaranteed response times. But the problem is what happens if in this setting only four has to send something, only four. You send for a certain time and then you have to pass the token. It takes some time and all the others have nothing to do. They forward token and then you can send again. Then you pass again. Then you can send again. So that's not uh, really efficient. So plus what happens due to an error, you drop the token. Hmm. If you drop the token, no one is allowed to send and that's it. So it is a bit more complex. You have to deal with all these cases, uh, etc. That was a technology uh, promoted by IBM a long time ago, token ring technology. And the idea is still a good idea for certain purposes. But this, like many other technologies, were killed by Ethernet. I will come back to Ethernet. It's just it's a nice idea because you can guarantee 
access, delay, even data rates, etc. But it's complex. It's also for cabling was a bit more complex, etc. So can we do it in a simpler way? So still, we want to do it in a distributed way. So all the nodes should be somehow responsible, but it should be very simple. And there's also a wireless history behind this, and it's called AloaNet, so on Hawaiian Islands. The idea there was, okay, you have all the different islands with the volcanoes here, Hawaiian Islands, and you have a compute center somewhere there on Oahu, and then uh, you want to use the compute center, for example, uh, from Big Island and from Kauai and uh, from Maui and from the different other islands. The point is, okay, how can you connect the computers over radio with this here, the antenna then uh, connected, for example, to a computer. And, uh, but we cannot make sure that people on Kauai and people on uh, Big Island do not send at the same time. If they send at the same time, the waves travel and we'll have a collision here, the antenna in Oahu, for example. Okay, so the so-called uplink, you may have collisions because this uplink from the islands to Oahu, this is shared here with Maui. So there we may have a problem. The downlink is not a problem because in this setting, uh, the main antenna then broadcasts to the other islands something. Okay. And the idea there was, why not just let them send? And then we acknowledged the packets by the main computer on uh, Oahu. And if, everything, and if everything was fine, then okay. If not, we resend. So we do not coordinate the islands. We do not coordinate sending of the clients on the uplink. But we acknowledge packets on the downlink. Okay? And that's a very simple scheme. And can be shown that under low traffic, low load, that's perfect. So this like in a classroom, if only from time to time someone has to say something, that's no problem. Just start, just going ahead. The problem is under heavy load. So if all the students try to talk, if all the computers try to send something to the central computer, the system breaks down. But that was the basic idea behind the principle it's called Aloha. This is derived from Aloha Net. It's like a discussion, and if you feel like talking, start. So we can fine tune this maybe. If we notice that there's a collision, then we stop and try again later. So now we can fine tune. We'll see. So we do not coordinate the nodes. We can send any time. We all use the same frequency, and the collision then occurs when we send at the same time. The problem is that the collision occurs only uh, occurs already with a small overlap. What does it mean? If I send a long packet and someone starts sending right here also with a packet, we have a very small overlap. But the problem is already one flipped bit destroys a packet. So the so-called vulnerability period, in this case, assuming equal frame size, is two times the length of a frame. So, and if we have a collision, frames are lost, etc. And the idea is, well, let's wait a random time, then retransmit. So how does it look like? We have three senders in this example. And if sender A wants to send something, just start. And we start. Okay. Then sender B, oh, this just worked out, and A... Everything is fine. This is random. This is not coordinated. So, okay, I just start here and the next one starts here. And we see we have a collision. So this collision, in this case, clearly destroys one, two, three frames. So they're all destroyed. So if you overlap, and even if it's just a single bit, 
the bit is flipped, packet is destroyed. So if I do not get back an acknowledgement after some random waiting time, I will repeat this packet. That's the idea. And also for CentOS C also repeats the packet. And why do we pick random waiting times? You see it here from the example, if we pick a fixed time for retransmission, we would have a collision immediately again. This is why we need a random time here. So that's random, these waiting times. These are random. They have to be randomized. They could again collide. Yes, sure, this may happen. So because it's not coordinated, so we just continue sending. And you remember up here, we should also retransmit this. Okay. Oh, so the retransmission caused the collision. This can happen. So the point is, we do not coordinate the single nodes. We just send. And if we do not get back an acknowledgement, we repeat after random waiting time. This is okay, as long as the round trip time is not too high. But what happens if the waiting times are quite long because of a long round trip time? Well, that's problematic because you have to wait for the acknowledgement at least for the round trip time before you start your random time for retransmitting. So you see, it depends also on the round trip time if you can use a scheme like this. The, uh, it's okay, this th scheme is fine if you have low load because then the probability of collision is also low. We can improve this a bit. The problem is here. I mean, Aloha, the, this is just, uh, I mean, you just walk on the road, uh, no traffic light, nothing, and the cars have no brakes. And if it, there's a collision, you die, and then you get reincarnated after some time randomly, and you try again. We, we can do this a bit better. So um, we can introduce slots. That means we divide time into these slots, time slots. And still, you can send any time, but you must start at the beginning of a slot. So how does it look like? So now you still, uh, A now wants to send, okay, please do so. Uh, B wants to send, please do so, go ahead, etc. We see there are still collisions. But either there's no collision or there's a full overlap of at least one length of a slot. So, so okay, retransmissions and still collisions can occur, but we have fewer collisions because the vulnerability period is only one frame length, assuming same frame lengths. Okay, so we can improve this a bit. So slotted helps. But this requires at least some central clock. And for example, in a Hawaiian example, yeah, the centralized antenna that sends back the acknowledgement can also send the clock to synchronize all the other senders. So slotted Aloha is a refinement of Aloha. Synchronization, well, that's a certain drawback, but few collisions. So that's good. We can do a bit of math just to get a better feeling about what is the maximum capacity of such a Aloha controlled channel. So uh, let's assume an infinite number of interactive users. They generate uh, some data and the transmissions are generated according to a Poisson distribution in this case. So we can do the math and calculate the probability of K transmission attempts within a certain time interval. So just to make it simpler, we count transmissions, retransmissions, etc. So a simple model, I do not say this is always the case for all networks. It's just simple to get a first impression. So what is now the throughput we get? Basically, it's 
given by the load times the probability of a successful transmission. So this is really our throughput, because if we have a collision, this does not count for the throughput. So successful, that means I can transmit my frame and there's no other frame transmitted within the vulnerability period T. So that's successful. Okay. And again, we can do the math and check um, what is then the uh, probability. And we learned that we have certain vulnerability periods, two for Aloha. And this is where we now have is two from uh, Aloha and only one for slotted Aloha. And if we then draw the throughput over our attempts of sending something, we learn that quite obvious if we try to transmit many, many packets all these simple Aloha systems will break down, go to zero, basically. Throughput goes to zero. Sooner or later, we go to zero. So that means we overload the network. We see only collisions, collisions all the time. So, and then we can also check what is the maximum for these curves, so of the throughput, and we learn that with a with a classical pure Aloha, if we load our channel up to, assuming this distribution, up to 18%, uh, that's the maximum uh, we can get, and then throughput goes down due to collisions. We see more and more collisions. Slotted Aloha is a bit better, so here we see it around. 36%. So maximum so-called utilization is 36% for slot Aloha and 18% uh, for Aloha. Uh, classical schemes, both not perfect, both break down under heavy load. Quite obvious. Okay, but be aware, this is only true for certain assumptions for the channel and for the distribution of the traffic. But this gives you a very uh, first impression. So the problem is Aloha does not really perform well under high load. Remember, uh, we do not coordinate those senders. Just if they feel to send something, they start sending. So we have to prevent the collisions. The collisions are our problem. Under light load, that's a perfect scheme, Aloha, because we don't have to coordinate something. So maybe, and now again, think back, to our example, classroom, lecture hall. What is a good idea when you want to talk? And it's called listen before talking. So listen before talking means a sender first examines the medium whether another computer is already transmitting. And the same is true for humans. So first you listen to the medium. You listen if someone else speaks. You should not start speaking. So please don't interrupt because then you cause collisions. Okay, so listen before talk, that's a good idea, but prerequisite is all nodes receive each other. Think back to the Aloha example. We had Oahu, let's say in the middle, and then we have Kauai here, and we have Big Island there. So they do not receive each other. Kauai and Big Island doesn't receive each other. So uh, if they listen to the medium, they check everything is free, they start sending. And the same is true for Big Island. Medium is free, they start sending. The problem is the collision happens here in Oahu. This is where the collision happens. So although they listen to the medium, the signal maybe of Kauai is too weak to reach Big Island. Okay, we'll come with another problem pretty soon. So that's a requirement. And always, if we talk about mechanisms, protocols, etc., please check the prerequisites for it. What are the parameters? What is the setting? What is the channel model? What do we assume, etc.? Okay, 
So now let's assume we hear each other like in a lecture hall, a seminar room, etc. Then if nobody is currently sending, you can start sending. So if it's quiet, medium, quiet, teacher, not talking, no one talks, then you can start sending. And this is then what we call carrier sense multiple access. So it's a very simple thing. So that uh, we don't need a master, we don't need tokens, we don't need a teacher, whatever. Uh, well, basically, we listen to the medium. If the medium is idle, so it's silent in the lecture hall, then we can start sending, talking. The problems are, well, we do not have guaranteed medium access. No guarantees. What does it mean? Maybe other stations occupy the medium. You cannot kick them out because you listen to the medium and if someone else is sending, you're not allowed to send. Okay, so if the medium is busy, hmm, it takes some time. So potentially, we have large delays. And even worse, we do not know how long those delays are unless we limit the duration of talking for someone. So we do not know. That's uh, one of the problems, no guarantees. And this only works in the end for networks with short transmission delay. And why? Because, for, for example, satellite networks, you send something, the collisions are somewhere up there in the sky at the satellite, and I do not even recognize the collision. And maybe my transmission is already over. So you send your some hundred bytes to the satellites, everything is over, you say, hey, it worked perfectly, but then the data crashes up there in the sky. Hmm. Okay, so can we refine this? To make the picture complete, I will show you some refinements for this carrier sensing multiple axis before we then come to a concrete implementation in the classical Ethernet to give you the historical background, but not only this, because then we could say, okay, that's old stuff. No, this is also important to know why we have the new developments. And especially if you continue for the wireless domain, uh, this is always the reference I will make. So, okay, what do we have to change? Because for the wireless domain, we still use versions, variants of this carrier sensing, multiple access schemes. So what can we do? There are different schemes. One is called a one persistent carrier sensing multiple access. Several steps. So again, when you have data to send, first listening to the channel. That's the same. If the channel is busy, you continue to listen and wait until it's idle. Wait until it becomes idle. Okay. When the channel is idle, the computer simply starts transmitting. So if you check in the beginning, it's already idle, transmit. If a collision occurs, the station waits a random time and goes back to step one. But what does it require if a collision occur? That means I have to be able to recognize a collision. Then I wait a random time and go back uh, to step one. How I notice that the collision occurred, there are different ways. One way is I continue to listen to the medium. And if I then notice, oh, this is not only my signal, but also another signal, then there must be a collision. Sometimes this is technically difficult, especially for wireless systems, because the signal I send is much, much stronger than the signals I receive. Alternatively, the receiver could acknowledge my data. And if I do not receive an acknowledgement, I assume there was a collision. So there are different ways of doing this. Okay, so if we have the senders here and you send your data, another one also sends data and you have a collision, it could be the case that you notice the collision. That's one thing. Or you send your data and there's also the collision and you never get back an acknowledgement. That's the second way how we recognize that there was a collision. 
What else can we do? It's called non-persistent CSMA. So again, that's the carrier sensing when a computer has data to send. First, listen to the medium. That's always the step. First, listen, listen to the medium, to the channel. If the channel is busy, now you wait a random time and go back to step one. Well, advantage, you don't have this continuous sensing. This helps, for example, saving energy. But it could be the case that you wait a bit too long because you listen to the medium, medium is busy, then you put, take a random time, three seconds. And then I check back. Maybe the channel becomes idle already one second later. Then you wait two seconds too long. But you don't have this continuous uh, sensing. If the channel is idle, yeah, I transmit. That's always the, the idea. There's also a so-called P-persistent CSMA. So um, we also have the first step. We have to check the channel. And now, and that's the new one, if the channel is idle and we have data to send, we send with a certain probability P and wait until the next slot with a probability 1 minus P. So if it's idle, this does not automatically mean I have to send. But I only send with a certain probability. Huh? Why doing this? Isn't that stupid? The channel is idle? Why do I wait? Well, let's assume the following situation. We have different stations, stations A, B and C. And over time C uses the medium and sends all the time. So we have the data sent and A and B basically check if the channel is idle. When is the channel idle? Ah, exactly at this point in time. Now, if A and B start sending immediately, we have a collision. So sometimes it's a good idea to spread out the sending with a certain probability. So, if the channel is busy, computer waits for the next slot, goes back to, uh, to step one. If we have a collision, you wait a random time and go back to uh, step one. And uh, this can be applied if we have slotted time environments. You see, CSMA is a basic scheme, but what do we do? Do we immediately send after it uh, became idle? Uh, do we continuously sense or not? So there are different ways of doing this. Why do I show you this? Depending on the scheme you use, you have different performance. And you see that certain schemes, so sending with certain probabilities, or non-persistent, etc., they have quite a good behavior where classical, a lower, pure or slotted breaks down pretty soon. We have here max 18%, max 36%. We see here we come pretty close to 97, 98%. So we really use the medium and way more efficient. So, you see, different schemes, different behavior. Okay, so, what else can we do? Hmm, we had collisions. You saw, for all the schemes, it could happen that we have collisions. Now imagine, if we experience a collision, why continuing the sending process? With all the schemes so far, all these CSM, uh, CSMA schemes, if we started sending, there might be a collision. Okay, but no one said, uh, please stop sending. We're listening to the medium before we send, listen before talk. And now we add something, and that's called listen while talk. So we listen during the transmission. And this is then the collision detection part. 
And now we have a very classical scheme, CSMA, with collision detection. So carrier sensing multiple axis with collision detection. So we try to avoid wasting channel resources. The efficiency should go down too much by cutting this transmission, although we already had a collision. So we listen during the transmission. And the idea is if we hear something that's different from what I sent, I stop transmitting. Okay. Additionally, I can tell everyone, hey, there was a collision maybe. And then I wait a random time and then I try again. So one idea is we have transmission periods and then we have certain, well, we listen to the uh, medium periods. And if nothing's going on, I can send. And if I had collisions, well, I wait for random time, I try again. So that's the basic idea. There's uh, also uh, some pseudocode uh, for this. And waiting this random time, this is also called back off. And the idea here is, if we have collisions, we perform this back off. If we have no collision, channels idle, we send. That means under low load, we are quite efficient because we don't have to wait for, for tokens or for time slots or for whatever. If the load is low, we simply transmit. But if the load goes up, the probability of a collision increases and then we wait for this random time. Why random? We try to avoid having new collisions. So we back off for a random time. And now we have something additionally. We increase the bound, back of bound by doubling it. So we pick the back off out of a certain interval. And if we have a collision, if we experience a collision, then we double that interval. And as we pick a random number out of this interval, somewhere here, somewhere there, by doubling the interval, we spread out the random values. And this means also we spread the time we wait for new access. So that means if load goes up, the intervals increase, we spread out this picking of the random numbers for waiting, and this helps reducing the numbers of collisions because all the stations, they pick an individual random number and picking the same num random number has a lower probability if we have a larger interval we choose this random number from. That's the idea. So that is one of the very basic schemes. Well, why do I mention this one? Because CSMA CD, that was the classical scheme for the slower Ethernet versions. So this is how the success story of Ethernet started. And it was still used until the gigabit speeds. And then basically it was dropped. So what did we learn? We have different choices for very basic mechanisms for this distributed medium access. We have the simple Aloha, node start sending whenever the node wants, and, well, if there's a collision, we retransmit after some random time. So we randomize the retransmission to avoid uh, new collisions. Because if several stations have to wait and we have the same waiting time, we guaranteed we create new collisions. We can improve it a bit by introducing slots. So if I want to send something, I'm only allowed to start sending at the beginning of a time slot. This requires a centralized clock distributed to all the nodes. Again, if a collision, then we retransmit after random white. We can improve this a bit by listen before talking. So we listen to the carrier and we start sending only if the carrier is free. But be aware, this requires all the nodes hear each other. If we don't hear each other, this simply doesn't work. Okay, listening to the carrier. Again, if we have a collision, retransmit after random wait. So, CSMA CD improves this again. We listen to the carrier, free, we start sending, but we also 
listen while talking. So we listen for collisions and if we detect something, we stop. So CSMA CD is the classical setting for a discussion between humans without a central moderator. So if people talk to each other, well, you listen to the medium. If it's free, you start talking. It could be the case that two people start talking at the same time, but you listen while talk. You listen, oh, there's a collision, you detect it and you stop. And then you pick a random time. And now it depends on your politeness. If you pick a very short random time, you start again immediately with talking or you pick, if you're a bit more shy, you pick a longer waiting time. You see CSMA, CD, classical setting for discussions. Okay, we can advance the sensing a bit. So if we do CS, the carrier sensing, we learned we can improve this a bit, the carrier sensing to reduce this waiting time and the probability for the collisions. So one persistent CSMA, we wait until the channel becomes idle. P persistent, we have slotted channels. We wait until a slotted channel becomes idle, but we send only with a certain probability. And the idea there is if we have set the probability pretty low, then more stations are able to send something and we try to avoid the collisions there. Non-persistent is a bit less greedy. Uh, well, if the channel is busy, we wait a random time, then we listen again. If it's then idle, uh, we transmit. So different ways of performing this carrier sensing. But be aware, none of these schemes guarantee anything. It's always a certain probability. You always may have collisions. And if load increases, then you have more and more collisions and you cannot really guarantee anything. How can we organize multiple access with guarantees? Yes, one is this very fixed scheme. So uh, we have a central coordinator telling now round robin, you're allowed to send, etc. or token passing uh, systems there, we can have guarantees. But we can also look into uh, new schemes that use two different phases and we try to reserve something. That's like a, if you book a flight or you book a table in a restaurant, there might be collisions during the booking process. Yes, so if the flight is already booked, overbooked, or the restaurant is already booked, so there's no free table. But the idea is, in this two-phase scheme, after you've done this reservation, maybe with a collision, then you have a guarantee that you have a seat and a table. Also in the plane, if you book a flight, there might be collisions there, but if you book the flight and you have a seat, then there's no collision anymore. So one idea here is we have a two-phase scheme and we alternate the two phases. We always have a reservation phase the sender makes a reservation and tells, yeah, I want to send. Maybe also the length of the data. This depends on the protocol. And then the second phase is the transmission phase. And then the real data communication takes place if the reservation was okay. So the idea is here now, this is quite efficient. Why? I will come back to this. Well, just to tell you, uh, it's efficient because we do not have collisions during this long data transmission. The chances for collisions, if you look at CSMA, is higher for the long transmission. For the reservation phase, it's pretty short, and the probability for collisions there is also lower. We'll see how this works. The drawback is obvious, we have additional delay. So if you just walk into the restaurant, works pretty well if there's light load and we have no delay, we don't have to call the restaurant. So you just walk in and have a seat. Perfect. But if load increases, so it's a real fancy restaurant, you have to make reservations because otherwise uh, you will have collisions in the evening. Pretty low chance to get a free table. So you have to make the reservations before you go there. There are different schemes for doing the reservation. So for example, 
you can have a central master that checks for the reservations and then tells all the other nodes when they have the right to send. This is the example of the restaurant. So in the restaurant, there's this kind of centralized reservation, but that's also the case for satellite systems. For example, you make the uh, reservation, the master then assigns you certain resources. That's also in part how uh, the newer wireless local area networks and LTE, etc. works. The reservations itself, there are different schemes. We'll see we have explicit reservations and implicit reservations. Hmm. What does it mean? So one way of doing this reservation is by a bitmap, for example. So we have two different frames, two different types of frames. We have one that's a very small one. This could be just a, let's say, a bit vector integer number or whatever. And there could be just some slots. And there you could say, OK, I want to send something. For example, maybe a second slot, there's nothing going on. So very small reservation uh, frame. Or um, you just collect the numbers of stations who want to, uh, that want to send, etc. And then we have a second phase with a long, 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 relatively long uh, data frame. So that's the idea. So there's one version of doing so, variant one. So all the users, I, they have their slot in the reservation frame. So if you want to send data, if you want to send data, then you set your bit in the reservation frame to one. That's the idea. And the, is the centralized master receiving this. And so the idea is then after this reservation phase, all the stations that have set the reservation bit that can now send their data in the order of the bits in a reservation frame. So the idea is if you have such a reservation frame and you see uh, this bit sequence 1001100, you know there will be three frames now. And first, the station number one can send something, uh, its frame. And then two, three, four, then station number five can send something, and then station number six can send something. So that's the idea. Again, we have the reservation frame, and you see station number one in this case doesn't want to send something, but two wants to send something. Then two can send, three, four, nothing, five wants to send something, and seven. That's the idea. Then again, and now <laughs> this is not that's not really. Uh, scale so the data frames are much 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 longer compared to these uh, uh, here we have 8 bit but the data frames could have let's say 1000 bytes for example that's the idea okay and then we continue next round again reservation frame very small just 8 bits in this example and then only 4 wants to send something and then no one wants to send something oh then someone, uh, then now four stations want to send something. Well, this is yeah, applicable, but only for small numbers of users. Because as this example shows, we can have here max eight users. So that's the idea here, uh, that we have a explicit reservation. So we explicitly say, okay, I want to send something. Hmm. But so this is uh, limited to a number of users. W what else can we do? There's also an other version. So we have again a reservation frame here shown in gray. And this is a limited number now of so-called contention slots. What does it mean? So for example, you have 100 participating computers or ground stations, if we talk ground station to satellite. And then the users, those ground stations, the nodes try to get a random contention slot. So the idea is, well, I as number 17 
try to write my 17 in slot number 2. Okay? And if there was no collision, then you're allowed to send. Okay? So if there's no collision, fine. In this very first example, no one wanted to put in something here. 17 and then nothing, nothing. Oh, 45 was successful here. Uh, 4 was successful there. So you randomize the assignment of your ID in this example to one of the slots. So 17 could be in any of the slots. It was just the station 17 decided, I will try my luck at slot number 2. And I throw in my 17. And I was successful. The same for 45. Successful. And you could transmit. So what we see here is we have a contention phase. So this is a contention phase. And then we have a contention free phase. Nothing can happen here. So first a contention, then contention free. And you see, it could happen that two stations tried to use the same contention slot. Tough luck, only 11 was successful. The reservation wish was destroyed, only 11 transmit something. Then the next uh, could be 25 and 12 were successful, but for the last two slots, so many stations competed, they will not go through. Then uh, the next will be 25 and the next then will be 12. So we see this scales to a bigger number of uses compared to version 1, because for the first version, we had a dedicated reservation slot for one of the users. Here we have a number of reservation slots, and all the nodes can compete for these reservation slots. But there we may have collisions. Why is this still more efficient than just sending like a LOA? Because, again, those data packets are, let's say, factor 1000 longer. And so if we have a collision, we destroy only these very, very short IDs in the reservation slots. But we do not destroy the long data packets. So if we have collisions, only short. That means that, okay, we have collisions, but if we are not successful at all, let's assume also here, not only 11, but 13 also wanted to access this, also collision, then we cannot send any data. We will immediately start again this competition with a new reservation frame. So we do not destroy real user data. We may destroy IDs, but this is much, much faster because these are very short reservation frames. That's one of the ideas. But we explicitly write our ID in these reservation frames. So two phases, reservation phase with contention and contention free phase. What else can we do? There are also quite clever implicit reservation mechanisms. So for example, binary countdown. Why not using the ideas again of a computer and assign them priorities? You see, different settings. So now we have priorities with the uh, examples before with the reservation frame. All nodes had actually the same probabilities of accessing a reservation slot. Here now we have, for example, priorities. So what do we do? All the computers that want to send data, they also send their ID during a contention phase bit by bit. We start with a high order bit first. Now the idea is that one wins over zero. So you send your ID bit by bit. If you send a zero, another station sent a one, the stations with a one win. If two stations both send a one, well, there's no winner, no loser. We have to go to the next bit position. So example. We see four stations here 
with the uh, addresses as shown here. So these are our computer IDs. So what we do now is we first send on our broadcast medium bit number zero. So bit number zero is here our uh, zero, zero, and those two stations, they have ones. This kicks out those two stations because the result is a one. One wins over zero. Think of you basically perform a, a or, so bit zero or or over all the bits. And then you see, okay, um, the result, if it's a one and I had a zero, hmm, I lost this. So we kicked out those two stations already. Then we take the next bit, zero and zero. We see both have zeros. Okay, there's no winner, there's no loser. We take the next bit, next bit, okay, zero and one. This kicks out this computer. And in this case, we go through all the bits and there's only one station left. We don't know this beforehand. There could be yet another station. Uh, for example, what happens if we have the station 1011? Then this would be the winner. We have it, don't have it this time. So we have a certain contention period. We all start sending at the same time. And the winner is the station with the highest address. So, and if you have a lower address, you give up and finally you, the station with the highest address gets access. This looks simple, but this means you have certain priorities. You give higher priority, in this case, to stations with higher addresses. So this can be used if, for example, one computer is more important than another. Then you can say, okay, in my uh, controller area, net, uh, so controllers for some machines, whatever, I've got the emergency stop uh, note, and this is more important. So if the emergency stop note wants to send something, it always must be the winner. So we have the contention phase, and if the emergency stop note has the highest address, it will always win and transmit emergency shutoff of the machine. For example, compared to going left, going right, or whatever stuff. So emergency is more important. So you see, multiple access schemes, depending how you organize them, they can also implement priorities. And this is an implicit scheme. There is no explicit uh, contention phase where I say, oh, this is my number, and now I compete for a certain slot. No, we simply countdown. This is called binary countdown. We count down using our addresses and the winner is the one with the highest address. Okay, yet another, just to show you what you can do, it's called adaptive tree walk. So the stations are here, stations A through H. These are our leaves of the tree. And so we have several contention slots slot zero, so there was a successful frame, so you send over time, there, there's a frame. Now the medium is idle and we can have a first contention slot. And here for the first contention slot, all the stations are permitted to acquire the channel. So if we now see, okay, so that's our first slot. So that's our first slot. And if we see there was a collision, then we have a next slot. And for the next slot, we basically prune, we cut off a part of the tree and say, okay, now only here, those stations under node 2 may compete. If we still experience a collision, we have yet another contention slot, and then only those are allowed to send, etc., etc., etc. And this hopefully then 
comes out with a winner in the end, maybe A or B, and then they send. That's the idea. So yes, there are uh, many questions to ask for this. This is just a first impression of what you can do with adaptive tree walk. So what happens if F and G cause the collision and you try uh, now giving A to D the right, but there's no comp uh, competition anymore because they didn't want to send anything. Then have, you have to switch over to the other tree, etc., etc. So these are just schemes that can be done. They have been used in different types of protocols. So now... You know certain concepts, and that's the important part of the lecture. It's not about, I have to know all the tiny little details of this or that mechanism. I have to compare all this persistent, that persistent. You have to learn concepts and why we have the concepts. So, summary of the concepts before we go to the protocols. So, link layer is important. We manage the communication between network interface cards. We use our bit-by-bit -bit communication service on physical layer. So phi gives us our bit sequences. So that's the idea. And we have to give nice payload to layer 3, the network layer. So we check for errors. No more errors. We know where the frames are. That's also fine. And we do not uh, cause overload, so we have certain flow control. So that's the idea. So error control, we have to detect incorrect frames. Maybe we even correct them. We learned a bit about the classical start with parities, but CRC, that's the important part, polynomial division, etc. You should know the difference between FEC, ARQ, forward error correction, when we do it, why we do it, and ARQ. Flow control, we have to be able to adjust the data rate. We learned the basic mechanisms, what does go back and mean. So if we experience an error, we go back to this point where we lost the packet, then we retransmit everything. We know what sliding windows means, how to, this actually then controls the flow. And we had a closer look to access control, so medium access control. Sometimes this layer is also called Mac layer, although link layer contains a bit more than medium access. So link layer has the medium access control and some other functions. So access control is always needed if we share a medium with more than two nodes. And there we learned a bit about the classical schemes, ALOA and some refinements of CSMA and had a short uh, look into some other mechanisms. Important there was also for access control, if you have more than one potential receiver, we have to identify nodes. So we need MAC addresses. And this is what we need then in the next subsection when we come to the real protocols. Okay, some questions. So we saw advantages and disadvantages of fixed TDMA, demand-driven TDMA. So fixed schemes or on-demand multiplexing time. Aloha. Very simple. When is this efficient and why is this still maybe a good idea? What do you need if we make it more complex? So there are some disadvantages. So what, we ha uh, what do we have to do to avoid the disadvantages? We saw several schemes. Which of the schemes can give us delay guarantees? So if we have to say, okay, maximum delay is whatever 100 microseconds to control a robot, for example. So what do we need there? We talked about carrier sensing, but what is a prerequisite for this carrier sensing that it works? So listen before talk. What is needed for this? We will also see, and I will teach you, that many of those more elaborate MAC schemes, they are not important in classical, I would say, wired networks for office use, uh, for intercontinental links, etc. And they are not that important any longer. In contrast to wireless systems and some industrial control systems. Why could this be the case? Why don't we need all these fancy reservation, etc. schemes anymore? 